So you can see that there are certain things we can do and certain things we cannot do, and that comes as a surprise to many people who want to who have an ill or, or something wrong and ask us to take care of that situation when we cannot do it under the Act. Another important provision of the Act has to do with the standards under which we can fix prices. We cannot fix any price which anybody wants. We have very specific standards in the Act, and that, and that standard is that we shall uh, have a price which will reflect the supply and demand conditions in the market and will ensure an adequate quantity of pure and wholesome milk. That means we, we cannot take cost of production as the sole basis for fixing the price to dairy farmers. We cannot take a, the relationship of the uh, price which uh, dairy farmers should receive uh, as compared with what labor is receiving, for example, or any of these other uh, standards which many people would like us to have. But Congress said, no, you shall fix prices which reflect supply and demand conditions in the market, and that's the only kind of price which we're allowed to do. Well, has, the, has this program been successful? Well, I think the easiest measure of whether or not it's been successful is, has it continued to exist and prevail, particularly in light of what I just indicated, that dairy farmers must vote it in, and they can vote it out. We've gone from 70 orders in 1940, rec uh, regulating about 20% of the milk supply in the country, until we were at as high as 83 markets here in 19, uh, 1970. We have 47 markets now, but that's because we have merged. We actually uh, merged some of the orders. We actually, with the 47 orders, we're regulating more milk than we did with the with the 83 in 1970. We're regulating now about two-thirds of the milk in the, in the country. But I think one of the other measures of the success of the order program is what has the dairy industry done in, uh, in the last few years? We've had some dramatic changes taking place in this dairy industry of ours since 1940, for example. We've gone from over 3 million dairy farmers to now under 300,000 dairy farmers. We've gone from about 7,500 milk dealers in the country down to somewhere around 1,500 now. We've gone from uh, a, an industry where we had uh, a good 20 to 25 percent of our milk farm separated in 1940. Until now, there's practically no farm separated milk. We've gone from a system of marketing where every farmer had his, uh, his milk cans uh, to a system now where practically everybody is in bulk tank. We've gone from a system of marketing where we had very rigid sanitary barriers of milk moving between markets, and practically all the, those uh, barriers have now been eliminated and milk moves very freely. And now with farmers with milk in bulk tanks find it much easier and freer to move milk long distances to take advantages of differences in, in prices. We've gone from milk dealers uh, buying and packaging milk seven days a week to now many of them uh, four to five days and some insisting now that they're going to package three days a week. Now I'm not saying, and we've gone from, from uh, uh, dairy cows uh, having a production per cow of around uh, a little over 5,000 pounds per year, now to about 11,000 pounds per year. We have a very efficient dairy industry. We have a quality of dairy products in this country which is unequal in the world. We can go anywhere in this, in this country of ours, in any state, any small community, a large community, and be, be assured that the, the milk which we uh, going to drink, or the cheese which we're going to eat, or the butter which we're going to eat, or the powder which we're going to buy to take home to reconstitute, is not going to be injurious to our health. This is not the kind of a dairy industry which prevails throughout the world. And we're handling more milk now with fewer farmers and with fewer milk dealers. We are spending less of our energy and our resources to get that milk from the from the cow to the 
to the uh, consumer uh, than we have ever had and, and the lowest amount of energy and time of any other place in the world. So we have made uh, great progress in this dairy industry. And now I'm not saying that the milk order program has caused these changes, but I do say that we have allowed these things to take place without disorder, which could well have been the case, and with the result, the dairy farmers have not carried the brunt of these innovations. And we are not at the end, by any means, of innovations which are going to take place in this dairy industry. We haven't eliminated some of the basic faults, or not the, the basic considerations which led to the need of having an order program where people can go, consumers and producers and milk dealers, go to a public hearing, present their case, and have it heard. There's no other commodity that you know of or can conceive where you have or people have that opportunity. Milk is perishable. We scientists haven't been able to produce milk from a cow yet, which is not perishable. It means that milk has, that product has to move off the farm every day, which puts pressure on the dairy farmer because he knows he's got to move it and cannot stir it as we have other agricultural commodities. Milk is still produced by the cow on a different basis than consumers wanted. We still have a seasonality of production in the cow, not coordinated with the pattern of consumption of dairy products. So there's pressure in April, May, and June on the dairy farmer to get mil milk uh, uh, picked up by the milk dealer. And I don't know that we have milk dealers who, uh, ha if they had the opportunity, uh, couldn't see any otherwise uh, how to take milk into his plan, who uh, would uh, not, uh, uh, who would still refuse to take milk into their plan and cut producers off. We've seen some evidence of that within the last several months. Fortunately, those producers had other milk dealers who would pick up the milk supply because of the equalization program under milk orders. We, uh, we have not gotten uh, uh, enough uh, or any truckers who are going to move the milk from the farm uh, and plants to areas where it's needed at no cost. Uh, and we have not gotten uh, all the producers in an area uh, willingly and, and voluntarily to share the burden of the surplus or the benefits of the class one sales equally with all their neighbors. These things would still prevail if we didn't have a federal milk order and, uh, order, and somehow there would have to be a program uh, adopted uh, which would accomplish a more orderly system of marketing. Otherwise, we're going to revert to the systems which we had in 1920, and I assure you, if any of you read the history of dairy farmers in, in the 20s, you would know that was not a very satisfactory system we had in those days. I know that uh, we're just about time. I, I heard the notice of 3.15, uh, and I try, I've tried today to indicate to you uh, what the Federal Order Program uh, is all about, what our limitations are, but our aspirations always have been constant. That is, we're going to try to do the best job we can in, a, in getting a system of marketing where dairy farmers have an equal shot as everybody else to get a decent price for their product. Thank you. I think your response has been assurance that we have appreciated Mr. Forrest coming out here and his explanation of his duties and what the federal marketing order structure is, giving us a better insight. Don't leave, please. Right now, I want all the people, because I'm going to get back to collective bargaining right now, pass out those sheets, because I've got a message for you tomorrow from the convention floor that can't be given here. Do I have workers out there to pass out those sheets, take them with you, and sign your name to them if you have not had them before? 
put down the names of five people that you're willing to contact. I believe it's in the next two weeks that you feel have not been contacted in the past year. That's a pledge to me that you're going to attempt to do everything you can to fulfill what I've been trying to relay in small meetings and everywhere else, that victory is within touching distance of this organization with the mass movement that we're going to put on immediately leaving this convention and bringing it to a head on March 1st, moving day. Do not take this lightly because if it is taken lightly, then I know what I'm trying to do with the help of you would be in vain because I can't do the job of getting contacting all of those people. Remember those people out there in the country want what you have. They want what you're looking forward to. I just wanted to say in complimenting members of the National Farmers Organization and a statement that Devon Woodland made the other day that woke me up. And I've been saying to the people, why in the world did you join the National Farmers Organization? Why have you stayed with it this long? I was told why. You never recognized, I don't believe yourself. In many instances, what I can say to you today is true. Anyone who thinks in the past has a pretty small mind. Anyone who thinks about only today has a mediocre mind. But to those of us who think in the future, have a great mind. Because it is in the future that the National Farmers Organization members and leaders are thinking. And that's why you joined the NFO. Not for what it had done, not for what it was doing at the time, but for what it's doing in the, going to do in the future. And that future is in your hands on those sheets of paper. Mr. Forrest, we intend to contact farmers by the hundreds of thousands across this country in the next couple of weeks. These are the people that are going to do it. We want you to know what to expect too. We're gonna to grow. Secondly, I've been asked to announce that if you have a question for Secretary Berglund, please write it down and pass it in. We'll see that he gets it. We must go to the main auditorium now. You heard the announcement. Take the papers with you, fill them in, and please bring them back to this room and put them on this table before you leave the auditorium today. Thank you very much.